Hello, this is Danielle Beach, um, and I'm going to talk today a little bit about the Real ID Act, driver's licenses issues for immigrants, and how we can all deal with this, because um, it's been a debate for a long time. There are now approximately, there are 16 states plus Washington, D.C., which allow for non, for immigrant non-federal ID driver's licenses, which are very different than regular driver's licenses. Maryland is a state that came with this very early on with S715 back in January, 2014. And I say early on because Virginia was the 15th state and didn't come in until January, 2021. So um, a huge difference depending on state to state of what's required, what's needed, and how they meet these requirements. And our main concern is, of course, that on May, in May 2023, the real ID will be required and that um, they're, they're going, everyone is going to have to have a real ID compliant driver's license. So that is where we're coming from on this presentation. Now, why the debate? Well, the debate's been because many people have said this promotes public security, public safety, communities, and it's bad policy not to allow people who are not fully legal or permanent residents or US citizens to be not be able to drive because the uninsurance rates are gonna go through the roof, that you're gonna have all these unlicensed drivers um, who are driving and it's going to undermine successful and effective law enforcement. So that's been the debate um, through, you know, the Senate and House on, on these bills. Now, the 9-11 Commission said, it did not recommend for driver's licenses to be tied to lawful presence because the people who attacked did not have, uh, they had driver's licenses. So, and they said it weakens national security. So that, this is why we need that. Now, what information is on a driver's license? Your name, your gender, your ID number, your address, your signature, and a photo. And then these, all these driver's licenses have included a certain physical security features which um, to prevent compromising these driver's licenses basically. And now there's another controversy which has been very active and they because these are shared from state to state and there's a lot of facial recognition and technology. So I'm not even going to get into that issue of facial recognition technology and all the implications that it can have. Uh, but I'm on the, also on the Human Rights Commission for Alexandria, Virginia, and, and we've had a lot of debates about that particular uh, concern. So um, just to discuss a few points, um, so let's go to the first slide here. The next one. Okay. Um, and just for those of you who don't know me, just a little bit of background. Um, I've been an immigration lawyer since 1991. Um, and have been working with AILA for, for many years on different committees. One of the committees I worked on was the driver's licenses, uh, which came out when the DC came out and, and helped to get DC come out with that. And then um, I did work also a little bit with Maryland. So the Safety Act of 2013 and everything on driver's licenses that I'm gonna talk about is regulated by Comar. So it's not something that's just flexible and they can do whatever they want. It's definitely tied to the Maryland um, regulations. 
So it, this will allow people without social security numbers to obtain the driver's license if they filed Maryland tax returns for the past two years, or if they were claimed as a dependent on someone who did file tax returns within the last two years. But that ID is not federally compliant with the Real ID Act. So let's just quickly compare that to what Virginia just came up with. Um, Virginia said, you have to live in Virginia for 12 months. You have to have a reliable source of income, which is not part of the Maryland one. You have to pay taxes in the last 12 months or be dependent on taxes. So instead of two years, they have 12 months. Um, you have to have car insurance and you can't have a license that has been suspended or revoked in another state. And of course, like Maryland, you also have to pass the driver's license test. And what we're not gonna talk about today, which is a whole nother topic related to this, is about people who are 15 and a half, 15, uh, nine months or 16 and a half, the young people under 18 and what they, their requirements are for the um, permit, and also um, for the provisional. We're not gonna talk about that. We're talking only about what people over 18 who are rela uh, immigrant related for driver's licenses, because that would be a whole nother topic if we were to talk about that. So why are these driver's licenses? Let's go to the next slide. Um, why are these driver's licenses so important? Well, they're important because if you can't drive, you can't get to work. If you can't drive, you can't support yourself and you become a public charge. If you can't drive, you can't take your kids or your family to doctor's appointments. And most importantly, the driver's license for many people is tied directly to their ability to get a work permit. So we're going to talk about the work permit fiasco, as I call it, um, and what a uh, fiasco in the sense that work permits that used to take, and I've checked the processing guidelines, uh, three months and two months are now taking 12 months and 13 months. Well, the work permit's only good for two years in some cases, in some cases, one year. So, you know, if you don't have that work permit, it's sometimes very difficult to get driver's licenses. So we're gonna talk more about the work permit issue for both employment and um, other groups. Um, so here we see non-federally compliant. So, this only applies obviously till May, 2023, doesn't comply with the Real ID Act. It, it, they're issued to immigrants who don't have social securities with Maryland or, um, drive, uh, or IDs and who are without expiring for over one year, they can, if they can get um, a Maryland driver's license or ID, which is like a work permit, which is over one year, that is valid for one year, then they can receive this non-federally compliant ID. So um, federally compliant, that's people who have green cards or non-immigrants with valid immigration status or US citizens. So it's only three very narrow groups of people. And so you understand here that there's a huge problem with the real ID um, requirement of documents. So what types of documents are going to be needed for a real ID? Well, three categories of documents, um, proof of age and identity. So what can you submit for that? You can submit a birth certificate or valid passport, which is expired less than five years ago. So many of us have clients whose passports have expired for different reasons, maybe because they can't renew them because they're asylum applicants. 
maybe for other reasons. Um, so that is the one that I see as a, a, a very big problem is the proof of age and identity. Um, Andrew, do you have any, have you had issues with those too, with your clients? Um, I personally have not, but I have, um, uh, so I was uh, scouring the groups to see what issues people had. So not so much in Maryland, but well, in Maryland, they were getting pushed back, but then they went back and asked for supervisor and showed the documents and then they were fine. Um, and then in Virginia, there's actually an email address, which I can drop here that I found. Um, where people who were having issues at the individual DMVs could send their documents for advanced verification. And then the headquarter would verify the documents um, and then they would be okay, would be approved for to get the license. So yeah, I can so drop we'll, the, that, the email address. So, so we'll include that. So the federally compliant driver's licenses, basically the way you can recognize the difference is there's a star in the right-hand corner of the ID. And if you see a star in the right-hand corner of the ID, then that means that it's um, real ID compliant. Um, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so we talked about the proof of age and identity. Uh, there should be a third, is there a third one? Proof of Maryland residency, there we go. Okay, so we have three categories here. So the proof of, of social security is um, either a social security or a 1099, which is um, basically a contractor or non-SSA 1099 or a pay stub that's less than three months old or W-2. So those things, um, some people have ITIN numbers. So the question is, would an ITIN number qualify as a social security card under the Real ID Act? I think probably not. But right now for non-compliant, ITIN numbers are being used. Um, thirdly, they have to prove Maryland residency. Um, that is, vehicle registration cards, utility bills, bank account statements, insurance cards, utility bills, um, uh, leases or mortgage statement, cable or phone bill. Now with Maryland, you know, when currently for non-compliant, you have to bring in two documents that relate to Maryland residency. But of course, our suggestion would be that you bring in as many as you can because you know, what if they don't accept one, then you have some backup and you don't have to come back. So I would try to bring all of these if you have them um, available. If not, you know, just um, try to find as many things as you can to show that, that it is compliant. So let's go to the next slide. Um, we've also sending some materials, by the way, of how to apply for MDOT MVA and the, and the website. We're also sending website of uh, how to fit into these three categories and what specific documents uh, in the boxes are needed. So we're including all the, those documents, which are much more inclusive than the PowerPoint, which give you a list of all those documents that you can use um, for each category. So um, that will be part of your materials. Um, so what happens if you don't have this federal ID compliant uh, driver's license? Well, you're not on planes, which already, frankly, you can't get on planes unless they're federally high. <laughs> compliant, so um, you're not gonna be able to prove for federal purposes. So say you wanna go into a federal building, you're not gonna be able to get in. Um, say you're a contractor and you need to get in, that's gonna be a problem. So that is the concern with, with all of these um, 
federal ID. So let's look at how do you apply it at the next sl slide. Okay, so one, you can apply for an ITIN number, which is a tax identification number through the IRS. It used to be we used to do this very often, but just a practical tip, lately it seems like this has become very difficult that they aren't giving it, it's taking months and it's not working well at all. Um, you have to have filed income taxes for two years before applying. Uh, we're going to give you the online document guide to what documents are needed. So you will have that. It's a two page document, the little boxes and tells you exactly what you need. Um, and then how to make an appointment, you have to use that link. And if you've changed your immigrant status, then obviously say you just got the green card or then obviously now you're gonna qualify for the Real ID Act because you're a permanent resident. So that's gonna make people's life a lot easier. So um, let's go to the next slide. So what do you do? You make your appointment with the MVA. If you go into an MVA outside of your county, the county that means that you reside in, that could be a red flag. And they, I mean, that's another thing we used to do. And those of you who have been practicing for a while have been doing the same thing, I'm sure, is we used to forum shop, right? If one jurisdiction said at the MVA they weren't going to do it, okay, so you took the person to another one and you were able to get it. But that doesn't work anymore because um, they, they, they are all linked in to each other and everything. And so it's just not working now. So you bring extra proof. So uh, though you only have to have two proofs of residency, bring those extra documents so that you can get it all done in one sitting. Because um, that's going to be very helpful. Um, we're providing you also with some helpful links. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about work permits. Um, we can move the slide. So here are some helpful links that you may want to use. So work permits, well, what has happened with work permits? Several different things have happened. Um, first of all, um, you have certain automatic employment authorization extensions. So let's talk about which ones are automatic and which ones aren't, um, so that you know. Um, so for example, you know, all know about the 180 days, the 180 days if you file, uh, because work permits are taking so very long. And the other problem is not only the work permit, but when you file the advanced parole that's attached to that work permit, a lot of times clients are saying, yeah, but I've been waiting nine months and I'm getting an interview and I still don't have my work permit and I still don't have my advanced parole. So what should I do? And my answer is, we go to the interview. If you get your green card, it's not going to matter because they are taking literally so very long. And uh, the Potomac Service Center is taking 11.5 months. Used to take three months. Can you believe that? And the um, Texas Service Center, which was two months, is taking 13 months processing. So you can see that all these categories have changed dramatically. Just if you're doing employment law, now you know H fours get work permits. It used to, it's taking approximately six to eight months. Um, and for an approved asylum, it used to take two to three months. Now they're waiting again. It's, it's months and months and sometimes over a year. Um, same thing with, you know, all these categories, L1s, L2s, used to take six to eight months. Now they're, they're, they're back at uh, August 2021 and they're still not processing those. So big problems for that. Uh, the National Benefit Center, the processing times are 12.5 months. So you've gone from 
And that's only processing times. And we know that processing times don't necessarily mean a whole lot because sometimes even though the processing time has passed and you do an inquiry, you still don't get your answer of what's going on. So if you are um, a TPS applicant, so an A12 or C19, that's great, right? And we know all the general categories, but now they've added Cameroon, they've added Ukraine, and they've added Afghanistan. So all these people can now get TPS. And so people are saying, but I have a work permit. Do I need TPS as well? So you run into that problem is what do you counsel clients to do if they already have a work permit and they are still pending asylees or asylum applicants, should you have them do TPS or not? And that's, uh, you know, that's a question for debate. Um, those that are automatically renewed are, and I can go through those quickly, uh, A3s, which are refugees, A5s, asylees, uh, A7, which is an N8 or an N9, and, and then citizens of Micronesia, martial law, Marshall Islands or Palau, that's A8, A10 withholding, A12 TPS, A17 principal, spouse of a principal E with an unexpired I-94 showing E non-immigrant status, Ls for spouses of principal Ls, it's A18, uh, A8, asylum applicants pending, adjustment applicants, C9, C10 for suspension, cancellation or special rule cancellation or applicants under NICARA, C16 for creation of record adjustment based on people who were here before January 1st, 1972. Don't get many of those anymore, registry cases. Uh, A19, people who are applying again for TPS, I mentioned that earlier, legalization, um, which is C20, C22 is 245A legalization, which is, um, and C24, and then spouses are in H1Bs, uh, which is C26 and C31 VAWAs. So the good news is that TPSs will get automatic extensions. So those are the people who get those automatic I 180 day extensions. Um, which is great. Um, so we have also that we wanted to talk a little bit about um, just some general things related to Maryland on that. But I would like to take a few minutes and see maybe if we want to answer some questions, Anshu, that have come up yes, based on yes, what we've already we, said. Yes, we have a few questions. So first, there's just a comment from Kelly Lego. She said that she had an EAD, C9 EAD renewal issued in eight days of filing from NBC. Um, so, you know, with all the delays, I mean, that sounds unusual, um, but good for her client. Um, so the first question, well, um, this is another comment again. So Claudia shared that her clients have been able to fly from uh, Salisbury Airport which is allowing them to board planes with federally non-compliant IDs. She's been advising them, clients, of course, against travel, but they've been able to get on planes with even with the non-compliant IDs. So I don't know if anybody else has had this situation. Um, yeah. And yeah, I mean, if anyone else has had that, I, I mean, I've always advised my clients basically not to travel if they've had any issues. Uh, before they get their green card, even though with the advanced parole, just because you also have all probably had clients who, who did go out. And then um, I had two clients who went out to the U.S. Virgin Islands and got stuck. They were asylum pendings and they thought that was the U.S. So they got arrested when they tried to come back in. Um, and then, you know, you've all had clients who, who travel and then they have a decision such as a, perhaps a denial of a 751 or something. And then they have huge problems when they come back, or maybe they have a misdemeanor or something else. 
And then they have a huge problem when they come back. So there's so many reasons why clients are going to have problems and put be put in secondary if they come back. So um, we've learned from experience that there's a lot of reasons that maybe we don't want these clients to travel if they don't have to until they actually get that green card. Um, so the other question is from John. He's asking um, if you are aware of how the MBA is dealing with issuing non-compliant licenses when the compliant, so if a person had a compliant license and that expires due to expiration of non-immigrant status. So um, I'm not sure exactly what context that is, but um, I have seen people issued non-compliant licenses, even though their compliant license expired. But for non-immigrant, when they had non-immigrant status, um, I think that that's the answer is usually no, they do not renew that unless you can prove that you're still in L1 or E or H uh, kind of status with a letter from your employer, I would think. Um, yeah, John would like to ask a follow up. He has his hand. Go Wait. ahead, John. Let's see, if, let's see if I can unmute him. Yeah. Hi there, Hi, Daniel. John. Hi, Hi there. John. Thanks so much for doing this presentation. So I've got situations where people have non-immigrant status, but their status expires. They can't re renew their status or something happens. And so they have a compliant license. The expiration date on the license is tied to the expiration date of their non-immigrant status by the MVA. At that point in time, when the compliant license is no longer valid, I've had the MVA tell us that our clients can't get non-compliant licenses, even though they meet the criteria because they previously had a compliant license and their system only allows them to issue compliant licenses once they've got a compliant license. Have you seen th this situation and any suggestions on getting them to convert a non-compliant license to a new, non to a compliant license to a non-compliant license? Thank you. So, I have not seen any specific examples of that, John. Um, I don't know if anyone else has. Um, it seems to me that unless they can fit under a different category of, of group, and some people have more than one category they can fit under, um, that they might have a very difficult time getting a non-compliant license um, once that non-immigrant status has, has, has expired. Um, yeah, so I had a client who actually, sh she had withholding, um, she had withholding, she had TPS, um, and then, so the MBA was only issuing her the compliant licenses, I think, I don't know, for some reason, for only for eight months. Every eight months, she had to go back in and get it renewed. So she, you know, she got annoyed by that, like every eight months. So I asked her to try to get a non-compliant one and she could, you know, use her passport for like internal travel. And um, she was able to do it with no problem. They gave her the non-compliant um, in Howard County. But non-compliant, I mean, yes, they will. For withholding, they get two years work permit anyway. So they can yeah. always get the non-compliant for withholding, people who have withholding or asylum applicants. Once they have that work permit, which is kind of why this whole fiasco with the work permits is so critical because that is one of the main documents that most of our clients use to get these driver's licenses. And I have, and I'm sure you all have clients like this too, which we get a lot of calls from clients that aren't concerned so much about their status. They're concerned about how do they renew their driver's licenses because they haven't gotten that work permit that they're waiting for or, and they, they've tried using other things and they can't seem to use other things. So um, I'm not up on what the litigation currently is or what's happening. The, the good thing is that some things are moving a lot faster than they used to. For example, uh, it seems like naturalization now is moving like two months, four months, we're getting interviews. I mean, and green cards are moving instead of taking a year, a year and a half, they were last year, they're, they're moving up and taking maybe six months or eight months. So 
I mean, there are some good effects of that, but the, but the negative effect is if they can't get that work permit and, and what we have done, which has been very helpful actually, is we have one person in our office who's kind of assigned just to work permits. And so she will either, uh, she will do a status increase on those. And those seem to have worked very well. Usually when we do those, we get the approvals pretty quickly afterwards. So if they're over the processing times or um, even if they're not, and we can show an emergency reason why they need that work permit, we have been able to get them the work permits uh, approved. So, um, you know, that's, that's uh, helpful for that. Um, do we have any other questions? Uh, no, those are all the questions so far. Okay. Um, I didn't really want, as I said, there was, I was limiting this topic to basically um, driver's license for immigrants and the um, real ID compliant documents. Um, you're going to get the list of all of those. So I don't think I need to actually read those to you and go over the, those. Um, the, um, the, the problem is what if you can't get, uh, if you can't pass the test, that's another thing. So, you know, you, there's online guides, how to make the appointments and that will be in the materials I'm sending you as uh, how do you make an appointment, schedule an appointment online. Um, but what if you can't pass the test, uh, the online driver's test? Um, it's not a difficult test, but you got to memorize all those signs and memorize all those things. So for some people, it is rather difficult. But the other thing to remember is what about clients that don't drive? They can get a, a, a compliant or non-compliant, I guess, but they get that, license, that uh, photo ID that's not a driver's license, but it is a full ID. So a lot of our clients are getting those too. Even if they don't drive, they can get that. So that's something else I find that's also very helpful. Um, and on the MVA website, as I said, on the materials, there's all kinds of links that you can go on to get document guides and um, driver's license tutorials and Maryland driver's manual things. Um, sources of proof um, and what they need. So what happens if you, um, you walk in there and you vote, okay? Has anyone had that issue where your client gets taken away their driver's license because they voted or perhaps they pretended that they were someone else or they submitted a US passport, which is like the death knell, right? If you submit that, because they need that work permit so badly. That's the problem is, is, is that creates a whole nother group of problems because once you have submitted something to say you're a US citizen, you're not eligible for anything. You, you're sort of done at that point. Um, so, you know, people are so desperate to get these work permits. Uh, some of them also go ahead and drive on their, on their driver's licenses that they had from their country, which is another problem because those are only good for, I think it's 90 days. And then they have to base an international driver's license and they have to apply for the state in which they're at. Another problem which relates to immigration, I just want to talk about some of these problems because I'm sure that these come up in cases that you've had is what if you have a client who has a Maryland driver's license, but they don't live in Maryland. They live in New York or they live in New Jersey. And you will see those 16 states, which I talked about, which issue non-compliant driver's licenses. If you look at a map and I lo was looking at one, for this presentation, I was like, wow, they're all the states on the East Coast or on the West Coast. And in between, those states are not giving those, um, those types of licenses. They are only giving the federally compliant driver's licenses. So, you know, maybe a client comes to Maryland or to 
another state that is offering these and gets that kind of driver's license, but then they're trying to prove that they live in the other state because maybe they have a marriage case going on when 30 I 45 or something else. And that's another problem because they're not following taxes in the state where they're driving and they're supposedly that's their address where they live. So I'm sure that I'm not the only one who's had those problems. I'm sure lots of other um, people have had similar problems to that, that, you know, are, are sort of um, the ripple or domino effect of, of, of consequences of not having a driver's license. Um, do we yeah, have- so, so Daniel, uh, actually, that's kind of what Claudia was asking. Um, any ideas what to advise clients who are living in other jurisdictions where there are no non-compliant driver's licenses. So while they're waiting for the EADs, so like E2 spouses that don't have the I-94 um, and they're filing an extension inside the US, uh, but that only allows for eight months auto extension. So I guess the clients, the, the solution that clients are uh, coming up with in this situation is kind of similar to what you just talked about. They're going to another state that maybe is, that maybe does issue non-compliant licenses and getting those. So have you? I've had that had a lot. Finished? I mean, I've had that happen a lot. And um, I mean, if we had a show of hands of the people on here who have had that, I'm sure that most of us have had that issue happen a lot. So that's a great question, Claudia. Um, I used to tell people just get a driver's license because, you know, they needed to drive. And now, you know, I'm not, if they have something else pending, like a marriage case or something else, you know, it's hard to tell them, well, don't get that, don't use or don't get that driver's license because you just need to wait till you can get the, the one that, you know, is compliant. But it seems like that's probably the best advice to give them those people who have no options, who have nothing pending, who aren't E's or H's or other things. Um, the problem with, is when they are each uh, E's or H's or L's, and they are uh, they're doing that just to get the driver's license. That's a problem for jurisdiction for where they reside, where they work. So that seems like that's creating a snowball effect. And if they aren't and they don't have anything pending, then I, I think that that's another problem because when they do, how are they going to prove that they, are you gonna put on all the forms then that they live there in Maryland? Uh, you know, it, it's creating, it seems like a whole can of worms. Maybe we can open it up to Claudia and maybe she has some other question that she wanted to ask related to that. Or we can open it up to, can you unmute her? Uh, yes. Yeah, thank you, Danielle. Yeah, that's that's my issue. I cannot legally advise them to tell them, hey, go to Washington or go to Illinois. These are clients in, I believe they are now in Minnesota. So, and this was an extension of an E2. So we don't have I-94. Although now if you would come with a visa, you would automatically be allowed to work on an E2. But we are waiting for appointment in Canada, which is scheduled for September. And I mean, the principle has been approved. The E2 has been the extension approved uh, back this September, 2021, but the spouse is still pending. So she needs to drive her children to school. And so, so it's, yeah, but I can't advise them. Hey, exactly what you're saying, um, go somewhere else and get a driver's license. But, uh, you know, I don't wanna <laughs> put it in an email or anywhere because that wouldn't be really legal, so. Right. It, 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 and it's not only a problem for there, but I mean, if we extend this to other immigrants, what about the people who are coming in on um, from the consulates? Well, the consulates are backed up over a million people. And those people, it's taking a while sometimes for once they get in here to actually get the green card. Some will get it right away, but some don't. And then you've got you know, now the embassies cases that used to take a year, you can't tell people anymore, or you'll be done in a year, because now it could take two or three, I have an EB2 that's been supposedly ready in Canada to be processed for two years. I mean, they've had all the documents. So it's, it's, you know, you don't know what to tell people, 
because when they get here, are they actually gonna get that green card right away? Are they then gonna be eligible to do a driver's license or what are they going to do? So I'm sorry, I don't have more solutions. Um, I have lots of problems, but not unfortunately so many solutions at this point. Um, you know, and, and what we do do changes with the time because sometimes we, um, we implement certain procedures and then we can't use those procedures anymore because you know, law changes or things change and, and we, don't, you know, we don't do that anymore. So um, definitely practical procedures do change with the times. Um, I think we have a few more questions, Anshu. Um, well, we have a comment from Patty. She's sharing um, that, you know, clients can travel with their valid passports. So they wouldn't need a compliant driver's license. So they could still travel if they had a non-compliant. Right. With a valid passport, comment. as long as the passport, I think, has to be good for six months. And, and the Real ID Act, which was supposed to go through, what, in 2021, right, has been extended and extended, and we'll see, maybe it'll be extended again, but right now it's definitely March, uh, May 3rd of 2023, so, um, and Claudia, that's a great question. Does the MVA still issue driver's license with 485 receipt notices? So I was just gonna try several of those because they used to right. um, in Maryland, they didn't in Virginia, um, but I always tell them, go ahead and try. And if it doesn't work, let me know. Um, I mean, it's certainly worth them trying and taking that in and seeing if they can. Um, but that's, that's also a, a very good practical tip that, yeah, we've been doing that for a few years. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So, um, I'm not sure what the answer is, uh, if they're not allowed to do that anymore or not. Um, and, you know, again, I'm by no means the, the, there's people who are more expert, uh, uh, Florence used to be on the committee with me and she was a big expert, but I guess I can't locate her anymore. So there are people who are really, really, you know, working with uh, the Maryland uh, motor vehicles. It's not as, in, we used to have a liaison, a la liaison. I don't think we have that anymore. I'm not sure why, but that was very helpful when we did have a committee that was a, a liaison to the driver's licenses. But that was also because they, each office was not compliant with the other offices in the same state. So you had certain states that were not being compliant with themselves. And so that was, um, you know, that was a big problem. And so that was the committees. And I think I served on the Maryland one and on the DC one. And those I thought were very, very helpful to clients because you could get problem cases to the right people and get those resolved. So I think ALIT, and Kelly says, yes, they're bringing it back. So I think Ayla definitely should continue that and have, you know, um, someone who, who does that. So um, uh, the fact sheets are gonna be on the website. Um, I wanna thank everyone. And it's good to see some familiar faces who came on this uh, presentation and I appreciate all your comments. They're always very helpful. We learn, I learn as much from, from you guys and your questions sometimes as I do from my own research. And uh, thank you, Anshu, for, for your help also. And of course, Angela um, Monroe from um, Maryland. Uh, MSBA, that's, she's amazing. Uh, so thank you everyone for coming on and I appreciate it. And I, I don't have much more to say. So I'm going to let you go back to what you were doing. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everyone.